The internet has spoken. Apparently, it really is the end of fasting. It looks as though fasting doesn't have any additional effect on weight loss outside of caloric restriction. This is based on this study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and a very, very good study. I have no holes to poke in the study itself, actually. The study was well-crafted and it needed to be done. For as long as I can remember, there has been a feud between the metabolic sort of fasting communities and sort of the calories in, calories out communities without a lot of give between the two. It was always just coming at this with hard opposition without really giving some, I don't know, credit to either side, right? So what we've discovered with this study is pretty illuminating. However, like anything, there is nuance and we need to unpack this study and we need to look at the details because there are some pieces that have been illuminated with this new study that are fascinating, that actually make me excited about fasting and metabolic optimization, even more so than I was before, even though the outcome of this study seemed to be kind of disappointing because people were like, hey, I told you so, it's the end of fasting. Let's break this down. Now, here's what's kind of interesting. When you look at this study, it's almost like, what the heck? Because we have seen so many rodent model papers, so many studies demonstrating that time-restricted eating or periods of intermittent fasting can lead to more significant weight loss, better glycemic control, better lipid profiles. The problem is a lot of these were done in rodents or they were done in human models that were extremely small sample sizes and weren't controlled in like a metabolic kitchen. They weren't really controlling things. Now, we've even seen the reversal of diet-induced obesity in rodents through simple time-restricted eating with the same exact amount of calories. Like we've seen in rodents that you can eat the same amount of calories but just change the timing and literally reverse diet-induced obesity. But we didn't have anything that proved that in humans. So a lot of times we were having to take a little bit of data here. So what did this study do specifically? They took 41 people with obesity, with prediabetes or controlled type two diabetes, and they put them in a one-to-one, -one, either a time-restricted eating group or a usual eating pattern group. And they did this for 12 weeks and it was controlled to the point where they made their food in a metabolic kitchen. So it was spot on to the macro, to the micro. And the only thing that was different was the disbursement and how and when they ate the food. So the time restricted eating group was only allowed to eat between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. with the bulk of their calories coming before dinner time. The usual eating pattern group was allowed to eat from 8 a.m. until midnight. Now, when you first look at this, it's like, okay, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., that's the eating window? That's barely fasting. That's 14 hours. Is that really even measuring fasting? And if you ask me, it's not really, but that's not what they were actually after. And that's what's a little bit frustrating with what's floating on around the internet right now. They're saying that like, okay, this study debunked fasting. And I've seen a lot of people, like it's like something gets triggered in them with fasting where they just like have to go for the jugular. So they were just like attacking intermittent fasting on this. And it's very frustrating because that really wasn't even the intent. The intent was to see if time restricted eating to align with circadian rhythm had much of a benefit over not. So a 14 hour fast is not really fasting, especially when you consider the difference in the time period that they ate. The usual eating pattern group had an average eating window of about 12 hours, 12.2, whereas the fasting or time restricted eating group at about 8.8. .8. So we're really only looking at about three and a half hours of difference anyway negligible. So then we get into the findings. Now, what I want to share with you is findings are findings, but we also have to look at our own bio-individual response to things, right? So if you look at this data and you say, okay, these groups lost this weight, this group lost that weight. If you're not doing it yourself and you don't look at your own data, then how are you going to really know? You can't, I can't base when I am burning fat off of what I see in a study. 
I can't base when I am building muscle based on what I see in a study. I have to do what works for me and I have to be able to have the inside scoop on data. Right? So I use a lot of different tools to measure when I have more fat loss or when I'm using more carbohydrates or when I can get the most out of something. Right? You know that I use all kinds of tools. Like I use glucose monitors, I use ketone meters, and then I also use a thing called a lumen. This thing is really interesting. This thing has been my fasting friend for a really long time. It's a full on metabolic coach. Now I wanna get into the findings of the study in just a second, but just to explain what I would do, is I would use my lumen to determine when I'm in an optimal fat burning state. So I blow into it and it reads whether I am utilizing more carbohydrates at that time or more fats at that time. So if I'm longer into a fast, I'd be oxidizing more fat and it would register on my lumen device, right? If I'm not that deep into a fast, clear as day, it'll show that I'm using more carbs, right? So what I'll use it for is timing exercise. Like if I am say, registering that I'm using a lot of fats. I'm like, okay, this might be a good time to do lower intensity, steady state cardio and oxidize more fats, right? Now, if I'm registering more carbohydrates, then I say, wait, this is a great time to go do some intervals or go weight train because I can burn through those carbohydrate stores better. And then I can blow into it again after my workout and see if I'm registering fats again. But some people might register fats at 14 hours some people might not register fats until they're fasting for 16, 18, 20 hours. And a lot of it has to do with metabolic flexibility in some ways, which is really just a reflection or a manifestation of someone's metabolic health in the first place. So it's very, very interesting to look at your own data. Now, when you're looking at these particular people in this study, they were overweight with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, which means they're probably not metabolically flexible. So it's harder for them to tap into a fat burning state unless they possibly were fasting longer or doing it for realistically longer than 12 weeks. So if I'm getting down to the granular with my fasting, I really do use something that's going to help me. I use data. I use like a handheld device like this Lumen. I put a link down below that is a 15% off discount link. So go to lumen.me slash Delauer and use code Delauer at checkout for 15% off. So again, it's lumen.me slash Delauer and make sure you use that code checkout to get that 15% off. This works not just if you're fasting, it works in a bunch of different categories, obviously. So a really, really cool tool to have in your toolbox and literally in your pocket. Like, hey, I haven't eaten in a while. Am I burning more fat? Hey, I just ate. Let's test this. Is my body oxidizing carbs? Metabolic flexibility is pretty important as a sort of proxy for our metabolic health. So again, that link is down below. It's in the top line of the description just underneath this video. So here's where we have to look at the findings and we have to see what is interesting about this study. Okay, first and foremost, let's kind of pose an issue or propose what could be an issue here. The starting weight of the usual eating pattern, the regular group, was 103.7 kilograms whereas the time-restricted eating group was 95 kilograms. That's a significant difference. And if we look at a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, took a look at over 7,200 people in multiple clinical trials, okay, it was a good, legit study. That study demonstrated that basically the larger the person, the larger the waist circumference and the heavier the person, the bigger the shift in weight that they are going to have. Basically, when you start larger, you're going to lose more weight more rapidly in the beginning. So when you have this kind of a difference, okay, we're talking over 20 pound difference in people, that's going to have more of a, what we like to call a whoosh effect. Like there's just more mass to be lost. For every bit of physical activity that happens in a larger person, more calories are burned. As you're moving a bigger unit of mass in the same activity, so a big person moving for 500 steps is gonna burn more calories than a small person moving for 500 steps. So point is, is we're already off to a little bit of a weird start here, and we didn't really account for that in the data. But the findings found that they lost about the same amount of weight. Time-restricted eating group compared to the other group, they lost about the same amount of weight. So close the books, make your Instagram reels, and say that fasting doesn't work, when in reality, let's be real here, let's pretend nothing else does matter, they lost weight. Okay, no one, I don't think people are really saying fasting is magic anymore. There's not even like one or two people on the internet that really claim that fasting has magical effects. Most people take a really legit approach to it. They say, 
This works well metabolically. I feel better. My biomarkers work better than when I restrict calories and it works well for my mind. But no one's been saying that it's really magic. Okay. I know there's some charlatans out there, but people really like to just poke fingers and create content pretending that people are charlatans about it. Now, here's where things are really fascinating though. When you look at the findings, insulin resistance markers and fasting glucose went down in the time-restricted eating group, but they did not go down in the regular caloric restriction group. This is what's interesting. In fact, the study says that it's not statistically significant, but when you look at the graph, it shows something pretty remarkable, right? Look at the charts that are on the screen for HOMA IR and for fasting glucose. Okay, obviously the time-restricted feeding group ended up with significantly lower glucose and better insulin resistance, like less insulin resistance. Even more remarkable considering the fact that these people were lighter weight to begin with. You would think that the heavier people would have a bigger impact initially, right? No, the lighter people did. But wait, there was another thing that we didn't account for. Well, it was accounted for, but it's not being accounted for in the interpretation that's put out there on the internet by people. Okay, the time-restricted eating group had about 34 minutes less physical activity than the usual eating pattern group. 34 minutes less activity. Why did that happen? Maybe it's the constrained energy theory or model where they were just consuming less at a certain time so they expended less energy. But either way, if that's not accounted for, then you're not looking at apples to apples. So 34 minutes less physical activity, yet they still lost the same amount of weight. 34 minutes less physical activity, yet they were smaller, right? So if a bigger person, starting weight was 103 kilograms in the usual eating pattern group, if they move for 34 minutes, they're gonna burn a lot more calories than the smaller person for 34 minutes. But the smaller people ended up losing the same amount of weight as the bigger people, despite being smaller and moving less, and they ended up having better glycemic impact. So I do see some benefits that are happening here as far as glycemic regulation is concerned. Another thing we really need to consider here is that over time, if you improve insulin resistance, we do know pretty clearly that insulin resistance plays a significant role in obesity. Like if someone is insulin resistant, it does lead to potentially more fat accumulation easier because you're impeding hormone sensitive lipase from doing its job and breaking down fat. So if someone over time is insulin resistant, it would be easier for them to gain fat. Perhaps if we can reduce some insulin resistance over a period of months with time-restricted eating, we could ameliorate the long-term effects of obesity, right? We could reduce some of that. I just wish that when people would put content out destroying fasting because these papers come out, that they would look at it reasonably. Now, caloric restriction is amazing and it does awesome things. I am not a calorie denier. But I do think that the timing of our meals will play a part, or the space between our meals. The bottom line with this study is that even though it wasn't what it was set out to do, it's produced some confusion again, because three and a half hours is not a huge difference between eating periods over you know, 12 weeks. That is just a new habit change that still lost a lot of weight, but also improved glycemic control a bit. They improved glycemic markers, they improved insulin resistance, and all they did is make a very subtle lifestyle shift. Now, what would have happened if we had have done longer fasts? 16 hours, like normal fasting is considered. 18 hours, 20 hours. Do you think there'd be a shift there? There probably would be because then you'd actually have a chance to deplete glycogen a little bit more. Then you'd have a chance to possibly produce ketones. These things that happen in a deeper fasted state. Then you might be moving into a little bit more of a fat oxidation mode as you've depleted glycogen, and as you've started to go through gluconeogenesis in different ways. And that's where the research and the quote unquote magic kind of comes in, is with these longer fasts. And again, not to make this seem like an infomercial or something, but that's where knowing the data is really important because maybe someone does oxidize fat more at 12 hours, 14 hours, but you might not really know unless you push it to 16, 18, 20, 24, and actually look at your own data. I mean, again, use a CGM, use a ketone meter to see if you're registering ketones, but you might not be that deep into a ketogenic state. So you might wanna use something again, like a lumen, where you're actually measuring fat oxidation and when you're using fats versus carbs, because what works for you might not work for somebody else. At the end of the day, it's just incorrect to say that time-restricted eating doesn't have different effects. 
Of course it has different effects. It is not the same. The caloric restriction aspect is the same, but of course, use your heads. Of course, something different is happening when you're eating at different times. You think our bodies are that numb and dumb where the only thing that they look at is total calories over 24 hours? What about the deficit that you're in in a specific period of time because you're not eating at that time? So you're telling me that deficit only matters over the course of 24 hours? No, BS. What if I'm in a deficit for the next four hours? Doesn't that have an impact? If I was grazing all the time and making myself so I'm constantly at the same deficit all day, wouldn't that be different than if I was in a deeper deficit at one point of the day and a bigger surplus at another point in the day? Not saying that the end result on weight could be different, but wouldn't you agree that something would be different? Something would change. There would be a difference. So this data doesn't help us a ton. What it does is it stops some of the charlatans from going too far, but it also opens up more argument that maybe we don't need. I think what we need is better acceptance that different things work for different people. So as always, keep it locked in here my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.